The elder statesman of the seminar participants today was born in Indianapolis in 1917. He flew A-20s and P-51s in World War II and spent the last four months of the war interred in a German prison camp. He first raced MGTCs, moving up to an XK-120, and later a Cadillac Allard. He shared a Cunningham at Le Mans with Briggs Cunningham, and later was hired by Mercedes to drive the production 300 SL in the 1955 Mille Miglia, in which he finished first in GT and fifth overall. An astonishing accomplishment. In 1956, after Mercedes retired from racing, he joined General Motors, working with Zora Arcus Duntov in the development of the Corvette racing program, and drove the Corvette SS with Piero Taruffi at Sebring. Please welcome the only participant here today, and in all probability the only man living to have competed in the Mila Milia, the Targa Florio, and the Carrera Panamericana, and still at 89 years of age will be at Bonneville this year to set a speed record for his age in a production car, Mr. John Fitch. Uh, I'd like to ask John Fitch. John, you once described in, your, in his wonderful book, uh, Adventure on Wheels, if you haven't read it, it's, it's a must read, that the uh, Carrara Pan America was a colossal practical joke. What, what did you mean by that? Indeed, it was a very strange and wonderful race, of course. Unique among the uh, long distance races. You know, uh, five days and five chances. Say, I've got to say something uh, that uh, Sterling may not have said that he said before. Great thing about the long distance races, uh, where you're going a thousand miles or more, um, and to can't remember uh, every turn, is you only get one chance to get it right. Out of how many? You know, thousands, really. And it's a credit to him that he did what he did. And I followed up in fifth place in a lowly, gulping Mercedes, which really not made for this sort of thing, <laughs> as most of you know. Was your co-driver much of a help to you? You had a man with you. No, he, um, <laughs> he wasn't. Uh, no, he, we did some tours in a very slow Mercedes sedan, and he confided in me. He didn't see how we could possibly go any faster in the race, <laughs> in a race car. And, uh, <clears throat> but he was game for a while until he uh, dropped the water hose and drained all our water out. We didn't have any to drink. And, um, so he just said, mine got, periodically. <laughs> oh, so he was quite a help then, really. <laughs> There's nothing like invoking the deity during the... <laughs> <laughs> say, Sam, you mind if I say something? This is kind of ad lib. I look around, I see all these people, and I, um, I think I was at Brooklands for the last race in England in 1939. I said, boy, I like this. This is great. I'd seen Indianapolis, born there. But as um, David and Sterling and a few of our British friends referred to World War II afterwards as the recent unpleasantness, it took <laughs> 10 years until I got a chance to race in an MG in 1949 at Bridgehampton. Well, in the meantime, I um, was very impressed with what I saw in Europe. So I came home from England and joined the Army Air Corps. There wasn't an Air Force then. And timed it in such a way, um, a lot of luck, that I was commissioned and given my wings five days after Pearl Harbor and was in combat, except for a couple of minor sessions as a test pilot, for the next four years. <laughs> and I wonder where all you guys were. Knee pants. <laughs> I say I had a full career. I, I had the um, lucky chance to catch a Messerschmitt 262 jet on takeoff before he got to speed when they were gone. 
I got one of those, and then shortly after, <laughs> they got me. I was, stra <laughs> I was strafing locomotives, and I spent the last two months of the war as a POW. And I got a Purple Heart, so it's very useful with the Veterans Administration, who now that there are only a few of us left, <laughs> are paying for hearing aids, but it's only a promise. And it's government, so it may not work. <laughs>